thank you for doing that. Thank you for taking a moment to connect with someone and answer that question. I ask you to hold all those answers kind of in, in kind of an imaginary kind of little basket <laughs> there next to you as we um, travel down today's uh, message. Because today's wisdom, it's a report. It really is. It's reporting this encounter between a Jewish lawyer and Jesus, and you heard this. But I think we need to acknowledge the fact that the lawyer's true intention was to test Jesus. After all, this lawyer was also known as a legal expert of the law, which surely meant that he had his own interpretation of the law, of the scriptures, right? Of the Torah. And so, the lawyer answers Jesus' question correctly. But the encounter for the lawyer was not so much about the approval from Jesus. Rather, I believe that the lawyer was after something much deeper. Do you know what that is? See, I believe he wanted to find a loophole to this wisdom. A means by which to evade the rule. So he asks Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus' reply draws attention to, I believe, the heart of the matter, the essence of this passage. And I believe it's where wisdom enters the room. I believe it's where we enter the classroom, where we become students. After all, that's what a disciple is, a student. And we all become students for a moment of Jesus, the teacher. Because here is where we encounter the divine, the Trinitarian flow, the Trinitarian dance, the counsel, the help that we need. Because today's wisdom, I believe, is for all those who believe they have knowledge. Now pay attention for this. But they lack self-awareness. It's for those who have a narrow-mindedness, who has created misconceptions and misunderstandings of this wisdom. They may have the right answers, but they lack intuition. They know the scriptures, and yet they maintain their biases rather than having actual knowledge of the wisdom they base their tendency on stereotypes and prejudices so here is the wisdom the meaning of who is our neighbor and who we are to love as neighbor is limitless borderless boundless but for too long Perhaps you would agree with me. Neighbor has been narrowly defined in American Christianity as people who are like us. Same skin color, same foods, same neighborhood, same language. People who believe like us, politically, theologically. People who live near us, geographically, in proximity. But Jesus comes to challenge these misconceptions. Neighbor is that which is different than you. Different in race, ethnicity, language, culture, political party, ideology, different tax bracket, different family makeup. And so could it be that Jesus was challenging the stereotypes and biases of this Jewish lawyer. And you might think that the moral of this whole parable, known as the Good Samaritan, routinely centers around emulating compassion toward the victim. However, could it be that the true moral of the story is to discover the unexpected face of neighbor? Why would I say that? Well, the Jewish lawyer never expected the Samaritan to be his neighbor because of the history of animosity between the two ethnic groups. 
the Jewish people considered Samaritans, listen to this, as dogs, half-breeds, heathens. Did you hear me? And yet, it is the Samaritan that comes to the rescue of the Jewish man. It is the enemy that shows love. You know, Dr. King once said, Love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. Could it be that the face of neighbor is our enemy? We think we know who our neighbor is. We like to think that we know who our neighbor is. But Jesus challenges our misconceptions and our misunderstandings. You know, I wonder who else needs to hear this this morning. You know, Christianity holds up a big slogan. Love God, love people. Places love as the core commandment of Christianity. It claims religious and ethical superiority in comparison to other religious traditions because of this very commandment. And it is perhaps the most emphasized belief in all of American Christianity. And yet, if you ask people, especially young people, especially black and brown people, gay people, women, trans people, you know what they associate the church with? Hate, which is the very different thing than love, right? They hate, they, they associate the church with racism, with sexism, with colonization, with homophobia, with lack of authenticity. They don't associate the church with reaching across boundaries, across disagreements, across differences. They do not associate the church with caring for their created neighbors, the mountains, the rivers, the oceans, the ecosystems. So how could it be? Could it be that Christians just don't know who their neighbor is? Could it be that Christians know exactly who their neighbor is, but it find it too difficult to do so? Could it be that Christians do not know how to love their neighbor? Or could it be that Christians know exactly how to love their neighbor, but choose to only talk about it, question it, try to find a loophole in it, a means by which to evade it, rather than actually doing it? It's easier to attend a church on Sunday morning than to love a neighbor on Monday morning. Whew. Why is it so difficult to love neighbor? See, I want to submit to you that perhaps to love so supernaturally, so counterculturally, cannot be done without the help of God. That it's not about the right answers, that this kind of knowledge one cannot attain, one cannot find this kind of knowledge on a TikTok video or on a YouTube link. To love like this requires help from God. And I guess what I'm submitting to you is that love for neighbor is not a moral level that we're trying to attain as Christians. That rather it is a personal reflection on one's stereotypes and biases. Why is our love for neighbor so limited? Why do we hesitate to love those who are so different than us? You see, I can only speak from my experience this morning. I have been helped by God to love neighbor, not once, but over and over and over and over and over again. I remember the first time I encountered a gay couple in my neighborhood, the first time they visited my church, the first trans woman that attended my worship service, the first ex-convict, the first unhoused person, my experiences in the black church and in the Spanish-speaking church and in the Korean church. I remember my first encounters with many new people, elderly people, people who were twice my age, three times my age. I remember my first conversations with Jewish rabbis and Hindu families and Muslim families. 
my first conversation with someone who had migrated from Central America to the United States. I remember doing my first Greek Orthodox ceremony, my first chapel service at the mission in Skid Row, my first visit with the Roman Catholic family grieving the loss of their loved ones, my, my experiences with rivers and mountains and oceans and animals. And yet, all of those experiences and encounters and conversations that are still happening today, by the way, I have learned to walk alongside those who are not like me. I have learned to follow the flow, to go with the flow, to listen intentionally and carefully with an open heart, an open mind. But see, in that space is where the lovely happens. It's where love is birthed. It's where love brews. It's where love grows. God has helped me to love neighbor, to stand with neighbor that is oppressed and voiceless. Has helped me to love neighbor by standing in solidarity with those who are weeping, lamenting, grieving, and suffering. God has helped me to love limitless, borderless, and boundless. And I believe God can help you too to love that way. Do I have it all figured out? Not at all. Can I love this way without the help of God? I cannot. You know, Beatrice Bonhoeffer said once, just as our love for God begins with listening to God's word, the beginning of love for others is listening to them. Are you listening to your neighbors? Jesus, our helper and the greatest listener of all time, calls us this morning, I believe, to check our knowledge at the door, to check our stereotypes, our misconceptions, our biases of who is neighbor and how to love neighbor. Jesus is the cosmic hope and salvation of the world, died on a cross, took our shame, failures, mistakes, transgressions, and our stereotypes, even our biases and even our misconceptions, and gives us his forgiveness, his successes, his righteousness, his power to love neighbor. Giving us the greatest moment of reality, the omega point of history, his resurrection that has liberated us, that has freed us, that has given us salvation. But what shall we do with such news? See, perhaps we can go out and do likewise in this world. Expand our meaning of neighbor. Expand our meaning of love. Remove our stereotypes and our biases. Love our enemies who are our neighbors. And be sent to actually love neighbor. And we ask God to help us. Word of God and word of life, and we all say together, thanks be to God.